Okay, so he's an uh, integrated uh, citizen and knows his way around IT security and data processing. Okay, and here's the talk. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad so many people are here at this late hour. So, this talk is about your health data records. It's more safe than online banking. Well, let's have a look if this is actually the case. So, Vivi, maybe some of you have heard about this. So, a couple of months ago, this showed up as the uh, electronic health record. You can exchange x-ray uh, uh, pictures, you can track which uh, vaccinations you've taken. So all these health-related information you can exchange with Vivi. And you can send documents to your doctor, and the doctor can provide uh, health data, diagnosis, and so on to you. So these are uh, three screenshots of this iOS and Android app. It was published on the uh, 17th of September at a a uh, large media echo. Um, that was because so many uh, private and public health insurance companies was adopted by this system. So 13 million insurers, uh, more by now, basically paid this app in the end. So typically this costs about 5 euros per month, um, but uh, the insurance companies basically pay this for their customers. One day after the release, um, there was another large media echo uh, regarding privacy issues with this app. So um, somebody looked at uh, this app and it turns out that uh, telemetry data is sent to different servers in the US and Singapore and well, this isn't really kind of what we want to hear from uh, an app that has health record data. So that was when I got interested in it and, and downloaded the app to have a look at it. So this is the result. A month later, uh, this was the result. Even more news coverage about all the security issues. Patient data in danger, um, serious security issues. And together with Thorsten Schroeder, I published my work. So um, we're going to have a look at the things that went wrong in this VV app. So Vivi is for exchanging, mainly for exchanging documents between a patient and a doctor. So the patient has a smartphone, has some x-ray pics, uh, the various documents, and wants to send them to his doctor. This uh, goes over this Vivi cloud platform, like this. So I send my documents to the cloud. Vivi uh, generates a session. This is a five-digit session ID uh, made from lowercase characters. Okay, uh, a few already got it here in the audience. Um, I'll, I'll continue for the rest of you. Okay, and now the doctor gets this link, maybe by email, fax, telephone, personally, and the doctor can then look at this document in this session. So, um, because a lot of people left here, okay, so five-digit session ID, that's n not really kind of the level of security people want to see here. So, uh, five-digit IDs uh, from lowercase letters, you can basically uh, brute force them in one day. I mean, not by hand, obviously, you write a small script and then you run this and uh, just to check if uh, there's a document and Yes, indeed. So when you actually find a session ID that exists, and then you get uh, this here as an answer. This is a, a set of metadata. So the name of the insured, insured person, um, address of the doctor, age, gender, language, and so on. Just metadata. But of course, I mean, this is still data you don't want to have public, right? I mean, especially with if you go to the doctor because of a sensitive topic, say um, an abortion or, or just anything related to reproduction, or maybe if, if you go to a psychiatrist. Um, so 
Basically, everyone can look at this metadata on this VB platform. If I want to actually see the document that was transported in this session, I actually need to enter a four-digit PIN. Okay, so I see I don't really have to explain this. Uh, how, how many tries do you need? 1,000? No, yeah, right. Okay. So, okay, 1,000 tries, and then I got this document, and then I got this. I only have to be faster than the doctor, and then I have this document. Okay. There were more problems, uh, so phishing, for example, you don't really expect this in a health app. So it allows to exchange documents between insured person and a doctor. So we see here an invoice, uh, two invoices and a prescription from a doctor. And if I open the lower invoice, then what happens here? Oh, I need to log in again. This actually happens a lot in Vivi, um, so that's a security feature. Session expires fast. But um, in this case here, when I enter a password, it actually doesn't go to Vivi, it goes to me. So it turns out I uh, injected HTML code in this web view and basically could uh, build anything I wanted in here. So yeah, phishing is really not what you expect from this health app. Thank you very much. But if I got the password, I'm still not in the app because it's a two-factor identification. Yeah, you pros with, with you know that phishing in a two-factor identification uh, doesn't work that easy. I don't have it yet. If I don't have it yet, um, I get a following request, HTTP. Use a password and a code. It's a TOTP code. I need that code. If I don't have it, what do I do? Oh, let's try. <laughs> brute forcing, a uh, big topic. Uh, it's as simple as that, but all metadata of this platform are open. I could circumvent the two-factor identification. But this is not the end. It'll go further. Vive has an end-to-end -end encryption. If I, as a user, send my documents not directly via the air, the doctor opens this in his browser, and this browser generates a key in JavaScript, and it's stored in the browser. The browser sends this key to the patient, on the app to the, of the patient. The app uses this key to encrypt the document and then send it sends it to the doctor. Okay. Problem is, uh, this is in local storage in the browser. If anybody here knows what this is about, and browser apps are cross-site scriptable, attackable, and Vivi was uh, attracted by three different. All I had to do is. Shik, uh, it's send, excuse me, <laughs> send a link to the doctor, and if he clicks on that link, I get his RSA key. I got 15 data with of high critical content. I published that together with Thorsten Schroeder. He just presented himself. Thank you very much for that. Because coordinated disclosure. Thank you very much for that. So, this is how it should have been done. Uh, we, on the 17th, there was published on the 21st we found the first security and hitch there was a telephone conference next day on the 22nd we had a meeting four days later with Vivi and the Alliance and on the 3rd of October we had the final talk uh, and the reaction of Vivi to our publication was a real risk for the data is not perceivable 
at no point I think you guys are going to see it differently. Netpolitik.org uh, published this and said the makers uh, to publish false data or fake news. And everybody said, no, nah, it wasn't me. I can't do that. You, gotta, you can't do that. You, it's not true. At least there were some people, at least at netpolitik.org, that published what happened in the background. Vivi was trying to correct uh, reporting from this and correct the contents. THS um, uh, was called by a crisis PR manager and uh, tried, so, so did we practically test brute force? And then he was trying to uh, thre threaten us with juridical consequences. From our point of view, we really tried proper disclosure, follow proper disclosure rules, and I'm still, I'm gonna go on like this. Maybe Vivi has realized that it doesn't work that way, and this is the way it should be done and not as the way they see it. What lessons did how many people f believe that within 24 hours all the faults were corrected? I looked for you. I looked four weeks ago. There was a, there's a funny, no, not funny, it's an attack. No, you shouldn't say, call it funny. Send a document as an insured client to the doctor. I can send him a malignant document and see what happens and get that document, the JavaScript, is a, it has an applet, and it'll run the applet, and it'll send other documents to me. That is critical from my point of view. Within 24 hours, let's see on the one hand, the attacker, and he says, the attacker says, is a Vivid user. The browser on the right side is the doctor. And he's waiting for the link. I have to show this as a video. I have to change the app here locally. Yeah, sorry, where's my video app? Here it is, here we go. Again, the doctor enters his session ID. <coughs> now it's not four, it's five digits. Oh, they've, yeah, they've corrected. He enters his PIN. Yeah, I'm a malignant user, I give him the PIN. He loads. Now he opens the document in the browser. What happens? The document contains a JavaScript applet. And it's just took Peter's diagnosis and sent them to me. All to your Gesundheitsakten belong to us. It all happens in the browser of the doctor. I'm still the attacker. No, not corrected. Okay, so something else that works. So one thing they fixed, you can't really just uh, grab the key. It's now read protected, but it's not write protected. Of course, I can just overwrite your private key with that one of the attacker because in the future if I ever get some documents I can decrypt this with my key. That's the problem with end-to-end -end encryption without identity management for the doctor without being able to identify the doctor. This way I really have to accept every key I get. I can't verify the authenticity. So what? There's thousands of broken apps. Why is Vivi interesting? So let's have a quick look at this e-health law. It was passed in 2015, so it, this introduces the kind of video doctor's appointment in 2017. 
in Baden-Württemberg. This actually exists. You can visit your R uh, doctor by video call and actually also get kind of remote treatment. In 2018, we had the Bundeseinheitliche Medikationsplan. And in 2019, the first electronic patient record should be available. And by 2021, it should be available everywhere. So the electronic health record exists since 2004. Um, insurance companies may uh, actually use this. It runs on the existing infrastructure and doctors may use it, but must not. And the electronic patient record needs separate IT infrastructure uh, as a minimum requirement. And it's also um, mandatory to support for doctors. This is starting in 2019. So there was an update this year for this e-health law because um, IT infrastructure and uh, health card, it's not really running smoothly, so we need to do something. So our Minister of Health um, said, tablets and smartphones, that's the way we want to access our health records and uh, this uh, Gesundheitskart is old fashioned. So he also said online banking is kind of our um, are a good example in terms of security. And all these changes, um, they we can't really afford to push this out any longer. In three months, this all needs to be ready, the standard. So this is the background. And VV is kind of the, the test case of the insurance companies for this electronic patient record. Because both the public and private insurance companies are interested in a lot of users using this because um, surely there will be also savings related to introduction of, of this infrastructure. So what? I mean, so we looked at Vivi. Now, how about um, some other uh, competitors? So there's uh, CGM Life, Vitabook, that's uh, kind of the dinosaur. And then there's the TK Safe that's still in beta. And also, um, regarding kind of the video doctor's appointment, there's uh, Doc Direct, and um, made by doctors themselves, there's Mein Arts Direct. So, who can do it better than Vivi? That's a question I ask myself. Okay, so kind of one uh, quantitative uh, analysis here. So, Vitabook exists in 2011. I already have. Uh, experience here. They were the first customer of Microsoft Cloud Germany. So they have uh, privacy and data protection on the highest level. So this is what it looks like. This is Susanne, kind of a, a test account. You can look at it here. Same with Vivi. I can save documents here, share it, share documents with the doctor, um, enter my da data, um, information on vaccinations. I can manage my whole health with this. It's called the health account. So kind of like a checking account, but you're for your health. Okay. Well, um, so in 2018, you don't expect this, but uh, okay. SQL injection, you can access unencrypted documents. Uh, you don't have, yeah, unencrypted. You have unsalted SHA-1 password hashes. Uh, yeah, so serious data leaks. So. If you test this and log in, there are test documents. Where, where do you take test documents from? Well, you photograph them from your desk. So, for example, um, the emails that are lying on the desk of Vitabooks employees here about security in the app. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so this is kind of uh, some findings from ITSEC analysis and, uh, well, yeah, so Susanne has it, this document for you. So Vitabook uh, flatlining in terms of security. Um, yeah, okay, so never mind Vitabook. Uh, one thing interesting here, they were the first one who retweeted Vivi. Yeah, so here, look, uh, Vivi. Yeah, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we weren't really about schadenfreude here. That, that was kind of not our intention. Okay, yeah, so typical tech startup. Uh, I think that's a foreign Cisco manager. Uh, not sure. I mean, that's just speculation. 
Well, typical them. Never mind. Okay, so let's see. Let the doctors do it. They know how sensitive this data is. I mean, they also they uh, are personally at risk if uh, they disclose patient information. So let's see what happens when doctors uh, co-sponsor such a development. Okay, so there's mine, Hausarztdirekt. That's um, a general practitioner that started this project. So if we don't um, develop the digitization of our world as doctors, we lost. Okay, so let's see what this doctor is doing. So this is meinartsdirekt.de. This is what it looks like. So I try to access an invoice here. It's forbidden since obviously I can't just access other people's invoices. I mean, I just wanted to see if I can view this. Uh, view ID 1, as you can see in the URL. Okay. So, okay. Uh, what if I don't want to uh, see this in the browser if I want to print this? Oh, there we are. What's that? Nicht so schön. Das will man, das will man gar nicht. Äh, Eigenbau, Eigenbau. Schreiben wir das ab. Lass die okay. Never mind. Uh, let the professionals try it. We're building it ourselves. Okay. Teleklinik. Okay. So uh, it's uh, the board of directors is one doctor, one IT specialist, lots of money behind it. Uh, State Baden-Württemberg. That's here the video doctor's appointment here. Um, okay. So you can try this on Doc Direct. Okay. Uh, well, not with real data, I hope. Okay, yeah, so log in. I want to talk to a doctor, get a diagnosis here. Okay, here, I mean, those insurance companies here also support this. So we have maximal data protection and prevent abuse on every level. We have a four-stage security system which offers the highest data security in Germany. Applause, please, for Teleclinic. Okay. So, if I want to change my password at Teleclinic, it looks like this. You have in red here my user ID, and in yellow my password, my new password. And I sent this HTTP request. Okay, so I asked myself, what happens if I change my user ID here? Oh, yeah, your password has been changed. <laughs> this isn't funny. This is the highest data security standard in Germany. Yeah, small people. Let, wait, let the big guys do it. The really big guys, you know, the people that have the money, the big company. Yeah, let's. We can laugh about the small companies, but let's look what the big guys are doing. TKSF, good example. They got an end-to-end encryption. I didn't look at it. Here's your key. The key is generated within the app for the user. If that user, if that key. If that key disappears or you lose it, access should be barred completely. If you lose your handy, uh, <clears throat> if you lose your handy, all your data is gone. So you don't want that. So you export that key. Oh, we're not that good with key. Uh, uh, do we know exactly how to handle passwords and keys? This key we got to export and save somewhere. How do you do that? Is it's as a QR code in your gallery? Oh yeah, in the gallery. Here's the path. That's an Android screen. There's the QR code. Yeah, that's in the public gallery on your handy. Oh, Google Pictures will have it, and all the other apps can. If you, if you, if you replace the key with a passport. And it says, please 
store your password in unsalted clear text in your gallery. And he's, this shows how difficult it is to implement this. It's TK safe, it's only beta. They're not live on it yet. You can go and try it. You know, small errors happen. Let's go to those that people that are around, have been around for a long time. CompuGroup, 5,000 people, 6 million turnover a year in 55 countries. They got a platform. These people got to know how to handle it. It's a secure medical cloud. All many, many different apps, many different apps run here and use the CGM um, cloud and exchange data via this. <coughs> these, some of these um, apps use two-factor authentication. If you're with AXA, which is an insurance, I'm privately insured at AXA, don't, don't, you should know, don't show who it is. You need an authenticator code. Yeah, you can't brute force it that. It's a platform. I, maybe I use AXA, but I could use somebody else. I go CGM. I use CGM, CGM Live for access, and I don't need two-factor identification. That's a bit stupid. I mean, what's, what's the use of having two doors in a house? One is saved, and the other one is just open. Or you can you know, open it with a single key. That's the same happens as with Vivi. Uh, probably Vivi copied from them and not because they're the only ones. I can six digit pin. I get a six digit pin. I give this pin to my doctor. And the doctor uses then his this six digit pin to access to my file. Six digit pin is brute forced pretty easily. Okay, here we go again. And I got all the access to the secure to the health data and uh, take it all off. Okay, there's another parallel. The big problem of this platform is it makes everything properly and right, but it got an elliptic curve, um, encryption Im implemented, AI is on the client side, there's no passwords exchanged via the cloud. You just, I just sent my, pass, my email address, I get my public key back, and oops. Uh, why do I get a secret code if I just send my email? It's a key derivation secret. I got a key derivation function. I give my password. I give my secret that I get here. Oh, I get client side offline my private key. Wow. Access to all that. If I got the proper if I took the proper password, I get my private key or the other guy's private key and I log in as him. And if it's not right, I'll have to try again. If I'm not Mr. Maya, I just try as long until it works. I got his public key and I have his secret. I, I don't have to, I can do it offline. I download it. <coughs> Excuse me. And they patented the whole thing, including that error. Don't don't copy it; it's not worth it. Uh, I looked at if it's relevant. Uh, oh, they took Dropbox. Oh, online banking. Yeah, same same. And I took all the email addresses of the Germans I found there, and I found who's recorded with um, CGM. I took a dictionary, and let's see how many passwords I can take out of there. And they're not very creative. I would have expected more from the Germans that are so high-nosed with their... 3% of all Dropbox users were CGM users, and uh, I had them on my little notebook three years ago. I, I could handle that.
natürlich nur eine Stichprobe. I mean, this is only a, an example. We sort of looked at, uh, no, not yet. They're not quite as they say that. Oh, there's, there's, there's um, the prescription account. That's CGM Bates as well. Uh, there's Dr. Teleclick, the TKSF. All, all those. They're all. They're all not, not quite make it. And it's, and we're still not talking about online banking. Sorry. Okay, so what? I mean, there's no perfect security. You will never reach that. So, I mean, you have to, you know, this is a numbers game. You have to look at the probabilities. So, let's look at the numbers. I mean, companies like CGM, they have to publish risk. So, there's IT processing risks. That's in their financial reports. So, the customers of us uh, use our products to manage very sensitive information about their own health. So, if there are security problems, this uh, could lead to damages we need to pay and so on and so on. So, it's a risk for CGM because there's financial, financial damages. So, let's see, towards the customer, uh, a paramount priority. Security is everything, that's what they tell the customer. And here they say, we expect 4 million euro of damages per year, on average. And, uh, well, the highest we could go in a year, 18 million. And with 5% probability, there's a higher uh, unexpected uh, risk. So, I mean, it could be that they, their whole ID goes down a drain, IT goes down a drain, but it's also possible that uh, all the stuff goes public. So, I mean, let's just take uh, this 95% and see what happens. In one year, 95% probability, you're safe. Second year, 90%. Third year, 86%. The problem with uh, health data is they're around for a long time. And, I mean, I can't really change my health data. You know, if I had a hereditary disease back then, then I still have it today, right? So, except, of course, the future uh, brings a definitive solution to my ailment. But so after 50 years, I have an 8% chance. Yeah, so, I mean, that's not really what we want. So, but maybe these uh, 5% are just unrealistically high or... or or maybe that's not also just uh, patient records public, or maybe they made a mistake. Let's have a look at the US. So in the US, um, on average per year, 30 million patient records were stolen. And those were just the ones that uh, had mandatory disclosure. So yeah, that's 10% uh, of the US population. I mean, I just uh, estimated 5% before, so I mean, that's a reasonably close. Then we have, uh, Norwegian in 2018, so it's not just the Americans. Here we have uh, 3 million affected documents this year. Yeah, so um, you're now uh, very well known towards an unknown attacker in terms of your health records. Um, then in, uh, in 2016, there was another case here. Uh, two CDs with, with almost all medical records of the Danish population uh, accidentally uh, went to the Chinese uh, visa ministry in Copenhagen. Well, I, I don't know if it, they actually sent those CDs back, but uh, well, may, maybe we should double check that. Okay, but we're in Germany here, so we can just uh, test this, we can certify this, we can uh, create new standards. So, do these certifications help? These here are all from the apps I've just shown you. So, we have uh, various certification agencies here. TÜV, uh, Trusted Privacy, uh, then there's uh, the Ministry for Data uh, Security of Rheinland-Pfalz, and so on and so on. So, uh, apparently, certificates can solve the problem. Okay, so they might be um, good for something, but not that there are no bugs. Let's go back to Vivi. They had a, a, they got a certificate 
got a, an exam and a TÜV certificate. Two different pen tests from two different companies. Uh, they're not, this, those unpublished, I couldn't tell but They got two again complaint pen tests. And after that, as we had, in the, that was the result was what I showed at the beginning. All this certification, blah, blah, for nothing. And now? What do we do now? Basic problems. All electronic health apps that take and keep security is 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 bad for concurrence. You have to certificate it. They most of them used to tend to take. Um, there is no proper architecture. <laughs> if you have to go, and if if you if you report uh, security, you found there is no proper security responsible on the side of Vivi. All the apps that I showed to you now, there has there are no disclosure <coughs> procedures. If I hadn't, if I hadn't recorded it myself, nobody of you would have known that. If, if I'm an attacker, I won't make it public. And now, in 2019, the patient data specification, it's online since a couple of days. It should be completely safe. Specs, uh, in three months, they will add specs for mobile and tablet. Look into those. They should really be safe. Hmm. Who knows? It's not relevant, basically. If <laughs> Why should I offer a patient uh, if I can you if I can offer a health paper, and I don't follow all these. Uh, Vivi is is, is a uh, is a health act and not a patient act. They, nobody will realize the difference, but if they follow two different laws and have two different security specs. <coughs> <laughs> this is not this is not bank data. I can't have a, a risk analysis and say, okay, I'll lose 18 million, pay those, and forget that. It's okay. You can't do that. Health health data are permanent. You lose them or they make public, then you're up. There is there is no secure long term storage place for that. If you're infected with certain uh, diseases, you can. There's nothing. No. Uh, as I as I showed, this is not a financial, uh, but it's a, 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 a generation. It's a social problem. We don't have no information if there's anything happened at now, but if I if I save my health data in the app, uh, I can inherit that to my children. Professor Bucher from Darmstadt two weeks ago, that's a cryptologist in Germany, uh, just published. We just published the fact. <laughs> There is no safe data storage available that will keep safety for 20 years. All encrypted data that you collect now, uh, that is a, that's a long-term pro uh, problem. If I collect all your health data, they, they, they have the same value 20 years later on. If I collect bank data today, in 20 years nobody cares about them. No, that's not me. That's Professor Johannes Buchmann of Darmstadt. And if he says that, he should know what he's talking about. About the future, the newspaper world, Die Welt, uh, sphere of data misuse. Um, patient must know that data misuse is not only punishable by law, but really difficult to do. Whoever 
if whoever does not want to join uh, who sh he, whoever one does not want to join should not have disadvantages but will not be treated quicker or faster and the resume is if you a, a long term lack of confidence um, will result in in lower quality of medical treatment now there's a lot of positive things to be said about electronic data i can i can follow the, the uh, i can store it all together i have it all and the one i can I can avoid a lot of problems. There is a lot of advantages for such a digital act. And if you decide that you do not want for your kids such an act, do you have do you have the responsibility that your kids will wait longer or have a less qualitative approach to their health? If 90% or 95% of the population uses this health app and you don't, and uh, it's, it'll be to your disadvantage, and that is the reality. This is the end of the talk. Uh, are you, <coughs> you have more questions? Uh, I just wanted to show what it is, what's coming, and I want to start the debate now, because now we can still influence and we can still enforce some kind of update to the law or whatever. Now, we can still write to our representatives, we can still fight back and we can still uh, think about uh, what happens to a society where all health information is open. Is that what we want to do? This is what we do here in general at the Congress. Uh, go ahead. Questions, suggestions. I'll be pleased. Sind denn Fragen aus dem Internet da? Sind Fragen aus dem Internet? Also, mit der vom Anfang erstmal. So, so about using VV and how does it work there with identification systems? Um, I mean, or can you use a throwaway email address or something? So with VV, you need to record a video of yourself with your um, actually photo ID. And you know, I have a twin, so I wanted to test this with him. So, uh, and basically uh, the doctor then checks the data on the photo ID and, and records this in the VV system. Um, there's also uh, different methods um, for different insurers. So I have a question here. So this awesome software, how much did this cost, VV? Uh, so Bitmark developed this. Uh, was um, I don't actually know, but uh, this would be a project for Fragt in Start. Okay, microphone eight. Hello. So I just wanted to give a comment, but I, I phrase it as a question. So a few talks ago, we had uh, this uh, images used for biometric identification. In the Datenschleuder, we need to publish those images of a famous minister. I mean, we really need the patient record und of a minister. Das, und das ist meine Frage. So, Würde this das is my question. Uh, can we do that? Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. This won't be well respected in society at large. I think so, but I mean, uh, other people have another opinion on this, but yeah. Microphone four. 
So, we had news articles in the last few days that Ms. Dote Bear, that the, the problem of digitization in the healthcare system, there was an OECD report where we um, came second last, and the problem is data protection and uh, kind of we need we need to remove barriers there i mean we can't say uh, we compare germany to the rest of the eu because we all have the same uh, legal framework in terms of privacy so i don't really understand the argument Every, everybody has kind of plays in the same ball court here and as i said Nor norwegian they they had this problem so uh, yeah i'm not sure about reducing the privacy here uh I think the opposite should be the case. Next question from the internet. So you just uh, talked about public insurance companies. How about private companies? Uh, actually, there were a few private ones. Um, Teleclinic, for example. I mean, yeah, they, they have the uh, kind of on-site doctors of companies. Vivi Teleclinic, CGM. Punkt, they are both private and public health insurance companies and they work with uh, private insurance companies together. So uh, do a little bit more research there. Okay, microphone three. So is there a possibility to do something with the reader and uh, the health card? I mean, everybody of us has this chip which could manage keys and I mean couldn't we build something on the basis of this a secure authentication system now that's a good question I mean we, yeah we have a trust anchor this card that actually already has a private key on it yeah so the problem is of course you don't have an USB card reader that you can attach to your smartphone and the idea is that you can do it with your smartphone uh, just like online banking otherwise nobody's going to use it then there's no benefit to the health insurance companies okay so another thing in the current version of the standard for a few days I think it was a week ago so the electronic patient dossier is specified like this that the access uh, is only possible through the electronic health record but of course nobody's ever going to use this except a couple of weirdos that yeah attach their card to the pc and uh, run an android simulator so nobody's going to use this so basically they already said that up to March 2019, there will be an update, and that's a patient uh, health record one point, version 1 1.1, and it's going to be specified how you can access it without this e-health card. And yeah, so, uh, but the problem is the only safe way to do it is with this health card. There are going to be providers like Vivi who are going to say, well, we can do it without the card, so, you know, just come to us and then the majority of in insured patients will use the easy way so yeah it's it's really a competitive disadvantage the the safe specification specification variant will not be used microphone six okay so a comment um pro it's going to be interesting when quantum computers e exist that have enough physical qubits to actually uh, simulate real qubits uh, in, a, in a realistic way so f that we can actually brute use brute force attacks on, on different encryption standards yeah so it's going to be really interesting to have keep data like this secret I mean especially if we've seen reactions like how slow these issues are taken care of so as soon as it's public that that the quantum computer exists that can crack this encryption 
we need to switch to a different uh, encryption scheme that's safe from quantum computers. Yeah, I mean, sure. Uh, you need to fall back onto uh, quantum safe crypto, obviously. I mean, we had an introductory talk. Um, I mean, who was there actually? Maybe that guy can answer the question. The problem is, in, in tw we can't really say if an algorithm we have today still is safe in 20 years, even if it's a quantum safe crypto algorithm. So we really need an idea how to save patient records for 20 years into the future. And uh, I think we should think about a distributed storage system by splitting up documents. Um, I don't know how exactly this could work. But um, I, I, I've read a paper about this. Mm, yeah, I mean, so there are approaches without changing the cryptography that might still make documents secure for 20 years and beyond. The problem is the specification requires a central data storage. Microphone 5. So you mentioned the uh, uh, general data regulation policy and the financial risk. So how many affected people need to actually take legal action or maybe join a class action or something for, for privacy issues so that the companies really get hurt financially so they change something. So this is actually not my area of expertise, but uh, yeah, I can't really say anything. Maybe someone from the audience knows this. Uh, the problem is, uh, how do you put a price tag on the damages? I mean, uh, there, there's no personal kind of risk for that, that your data gets public and then there's something 10 years down the road that, that happens to you that's bad. I mean, how can you prove this in court? How, how can you put a number, a dollar number on this? Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, when, when your health record is, is now public for maybe the next 70 years of your life or so, depending on how old you get. So, with the issues you discovered in these apps, um, you, there probably won't be, we don't have to wait for 20 years until the data gets public. Um, this statement, there is no, uh, no... Uh, medium to save documents safely for 20 years into the future that's um, based on a centralized data system. And all these management systems we have now for, for data, uh, you can make a very similar point. And I mean, I'm surprised we uh, think in terms of 20 years. Yeah, so these 20 years I got from a newspaper article. Um, so maybe you should actually check the literature. So. For the moment, the documents are dis distributed between all the doctors and uh, clinics, and so stuff is being leaked uh, from one or the other place. But but if we have a centralized storage, then it's really more easily attackable if it's all in one place. And yeah, it's also going to be used more, and and there's a single place where I can actually steal a whole lot of documents. Or where was this question going? So you mentioned CGM. They have several uh, competitors that they bought. And they offer to their doctors that they can convert uh, data from the other products since they don't offer those anymore. And then your data basically from the doctor gets converted. So there, there is already, it's somewhat centralized. Yeah, the problem is, of course, um, this is not very public yet where leaks actually happened. I mean, the thing that I showed from the US, those were uh, all cases where it was legally required to report this. And in Germany, we haven't really heard a lot about this. Microphone 4. So these health data records uh, should be used for research in a pseudonymized form. Can you say something more about that? I mean, I didn't put it in the talk, that's kind of a whole topic on its own. Um, well, VV also saves data in a pseudonymous code, but uh, sends your two-factor authentication code with that. Yeah, so basically when you log into VV, it also 
logs you in into your pseudonym account. So there's a shadow profile to every real profile and you're logged in two times. And so, yeah, with your device, with your token. So on sites of the VV platform, it's really easy to uh, to identify you again. So you really have to trust the service provider here. Um, then there's the idea that you can actually kind of donate your data. Or maybe that it can even be enforced legally to provide data to uh, medical research. I thought the exchange of encrypted documents uh, or, or just uh, sensitive data was solved in, in the places I can look into. Uh, we manage uh, to exchange data safely. I mean, my, my C file software can do this. Why, why can't doctors do this? Is, is there maybe a solution that doctors could use that we can propose to them? I mean, I don't know about uh, post-quantum cryptography and, and what they can do in Nevada, but... Uh, yeah, the problem is specification is not always that which is implemented. I mean, for Vivi, there's a white paper uh, where everything is specified nicely, but... but um, it's not necessarily the thing that was actually implemented. So they don't actually check that it was implemented the way it says so in the white paper. And so what was the question again? Is there an alternative we can offer the doctors now to exchange uh, documents with the patients? Uh, it's very, very difficult. Try to have it as decentralized as possible. I can't really recommend anything. I mean, <laughs> print it out and, and, and fax it to them. Yeah. I don't know. And the problem is, you know, he's right. So if we have end-to-end -end encrypted, maybe with PGP, then you need to exchange keys. You need to verify the keys. This needs to be automated somehow. And, well, I mean, this is missing now. So we have the IT infrastructure for the doctors now. There is identity management um, on the side of the on the patient end. There's the electronic health card, but nobody wants to link these two things because there there's no utility. Number four. What's the difference between health data and patient data? So the health record and the patient record. So, so when you have a patient record, the doctors have to save it in that. The health record uh, use is optional. So another question to Vivi. So the private key was saved in in as a read encrypted uh, read protected in the browser of the doctor so the web crypto api um, allows you to mark a key as exportable or not so there's an object it uh, prevents uh, access if as long as the javascript engine is implemented uh, correctly so you give your data in there and the engine does that crypto yeah, yeah, so you have an object and you have a method encrypt and decrypt, but you can't access the key. Okay, w want to share an idea here that's not really on a technical level, but uh, yeah. So all health records are sensitive, especially things like um, abortion, as you said, or my um, HIV state or, or psychological disorders. And I mean, an idea would be to uh, that we ex network with um, interest groups that actually are in these domains, just to kind of see what they want or what they have. I mean, technically, in the end, this type of information is going to be public, and it's more a question of how, as a society, will we deal with it when that happens. 
this is actually what I want to say with my talk. So we have, I mean, the technical things I've talked about, but we as a society have to ask ourselves, how do we deal with this? Okay, another question. So another comment. So about a year ago, I got a mail from CGM. I uh, found this one again. So from a doctor, I got a link. It's HTTP, first of all. And I was supposed to enter my uh, personal information on this site. And I said, well, I'm not actually going to do this. I mailed them. I would rather have HTTPS. And I got the answer uh, regarding the encryption. So... So they said they have an internal secure connection and uh, data is transferred in encrypted form and that's uh, legally required. So that's the answer I got. Yeah, <laughs> interesting comment. Yeah, so that's the kind of quality we can look forward to.